same. There's just a lot to keep track of. And also, I've just never been very competitive. So it's like, yeah. beat your opponent, and I'm like, why? Yeah. I'd, I'd rather have... I, I prefer those things where it's like checkmate in three moves. I can do that. That That's that's Yeah, better. chess puzzles. Yeah. Anyway, welcome to the stream. We're talking about chess. Um, and how I would prefer it if it was in multiple dimensions. Also, Chaos Chess, coming soon, I guess. Um, <laughs> at, one, at some point. It needs sound effects. Um, and that's about it, really. <clears throat> um, just, just have the Wilhelm scream every time you move a chess piece. Uh, we, we may come to that during this stream, actually. <laughs> um, Chaos Chess is also good. No, no one's played it yet. I mean, it should be. Hopefully it'll be good, because it'll be free. Um, headache buddies, oh no! You've come to the wrong place. This is a math stream. <laughs> so, uh, due to um, the people having uh, low energy and or other things to do, better things to do, um, it is, it's me and Ragnall today. Um, and we are here with our little... little sleepy cats. They're sleepy tired. Yeah, you've been a maths kind of day. You've been doing killer Sudoku. We were talking about that. Uh, yeah, we were talking about that as well. Also, I have not full screened, so you can see the thing at the top. There we go. That's better. Sleepy cats. Yeah. Um. So the games begin. So the idea that we came up with this about half an hour ago, um, and by came up with this, it just sort of happened in conversation. That the fact that the two of us uh, have a mathematical background. One of us is actually a mathematician. The other one. Uh, left and became a destitute illustrator um <laughs> we might as well do something with maths and maths is full of weird names um so we're gonna just give each other weird names and draw what we, what comes into our head i think that's fine <laughs> unless anyone else has a better idea <laughs> uh, yeah oh. the fun thing though with math names is they, they fall under sort of three categories. Uh, literal in Latin, literal in English, or named after some dude. <laughs> There's a lot named after some dude. <laughs> One of them on my list is also named after some dude, but their name is also another thing, so it's fine. Um, uh, I, would, I would like to give a shout out uh, to one that I will not be giving, uh, the Tits Group. Um, because Chib's not here. Um, that also goes for the tits cone. But, uh, and I think it's pronounced teats, but whatever. I read it on a message board when I was at university and it made me laugh, so. Um. I, I still think one of my favorites is the hairy ball sack. The, the, the hairy ball theorem, that is a thing. <laughs> it's actually interesting because it's got all to do with, like, cyclones and things like that. Um, oh yeah, there's um, some interesting stuff in there. It's just one of those things of like you sit there and go, all right, either they had no idea what they were doing <laughs> or they had every idea of what they were doing. They had every idea what they were doing. And like, there, there's no middle ground here. <laughs> the, th the theorem, by the way, is that you can't comb a hairy ball. Uh, not in a way that uh, doesn't create singularities, li little cyclones. Uh, um, and if you're confused as to what a singularity might be in hair, think about like the, the back of a baby's head. Yeah where the hair sort of gets into weird swirls and cowlicks, that's usually what we're meaning when we're talking about a singularity as far as physical stuff <laughs> like hair. Singularity is one of those words that has a lot of different meanings depending on which mathematician you're talking to. <laughs> yeah, but in the case of we're dealing with a physical thing with something we're sort of combing around it, uh, basically the idea is at some point the way of smoothing stuff around the shape uh, isn't going to work somewhere, and you have to decide how how it's not going to work. And that's how you get things like cowlicks and swirls in fingerprints. Try and brush the sphere in some sort of sensible direction at some point. You're going to end up with a tight circle going on. Like that. <laughs> I can't draw arrows. <laughs> uh, can you tell I I'm, don't work in vector calculus? Um, 
don't worry, I do, and I don't bother drawing it myself. I <laughs> yes, have okay. software that does it for me, because I basically, when you're dealing with 3D shapes, it's like, I can draw a box, and I can draw a potato chip. And that's what you're going to get when it comes to talking <laughs> about three-dimensional fields. Well, <clears throat> that's fine, um, because to me, a field is a different thing. Um, we'll get to that. So yeah, I tried to pick words and things that are related to the things that I like in maths. So, and uh, I'm sure if you take things from statistics, I would have no idea what they are. So that works. You, you're probably more likely to know than my ones, but we'll try it now. It's a lovely hair ripple. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, and if that drawing's anything to go by, this is going to be a janky stream. Right. Uh, do, uh, do you want to I mean, give me a thing? I mean, there's nothing that says we have to draw, like, what it is mathematically, because some of these things, it's like, there's no good way oh, of no. doing that anyway. Absolutely not. If uh, There's at least one thing here that if you were to try and draw it mathematically, you would we would be here till the end of the universe. So don't worry about it. <laughs> maths has been let loose, I miss. <laughs> there's maths and also sleepy cat. Sleepy cat and sleepy cat. Two. Two good sleepy cats. Uh, right, well, given that I usually start these streams by saying who wants to go first, um, shall I go first? <laughs> sure. I'll, I'll doodle things. I don't know how much room we're going to take up, whether we just dr draw it all on the same thing. Just do lots of little doodles. Tons of little things. Yeah, the problem with statistics, though, is that like a lot of the stuff is either Latin, uh, in some cases, literally Latin or Greek letters, because it's like, what do we name this after? Let's yeah. just name this after the letter we use for it. <laughs> you got a lot of mu's and sigmas in the statistics, I seem to recall. Yep. Um, and or named after literally some dude. Uh, sometimes it's the guy who found it or published the paper on it. Sometimes it's just, hey, we like this dude, we'll stick the name on it. Um, like, there is a... <clears throat> oh, not, there's a probability distribution called a Bernoulli distribution. Bernoulli's not the one who wrote the papers on it. The people who wrote the papers on it just kind of went, hey, let's just call it a Bernoulli distribution, because he did a lot of <laughs> probability theory. It's like, cool. Wonderful. Bloody Bernoulli. <clears throat> well, wasn't there a family of Bernoullis? And that's why their name keeps cropping up all over the place. They yeah, there was like things. two or three of them that published stuff in various math and natural science stuff. And so I guess it's just kind of like, okay, well, <clears throat> we're going to just keep doing that. Um, the thing I have for you, Chris, is the Me? man with me you. The, the, the what now? <laughs> the man, the man with me you? Let me type that in. Man with me you. <laughs> man with me you. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, <laughs> well, my first thought is uh, Whitney Houston. Um, <laughs> so I'm gonna draw a bodyguard. Uh, <laughs> oh, I mean, yeah, that works. <laughs> Whitney Houston, we have the bodyguard. Yeah, this was the man with the golden gun. This is the man with the, the you. <laughs> they have you. They have your back. They're a bodyguard. Well, hopefully they have your back. Because otherwise they'd be a pretty bad bodyguard. <laughs> Also, I just realized since there's only two of us here, it's going to be a lot quieter than it is usually. Yeah, should I put music on? <laughs> I mean, you won't hear it, but <laughs> for the sake of the stream, I could put some Louis Jong in the background. We we can prattle on about maths. Um, this is, is kind of coincidental because on Tuesday next week, uh, it is the fifth anniversary of my submitting my corrected thesis, um, and thus the fifth anniversary of my mathematical emancipation, I guess. Um, <laughs> And I was planning on Wednesday of doing a little stream where I tried to explain my thesis in as close to real terms as I possibly can, given that it's algebra. 
that's just a really funny way of phrasing that. It's like, I published this thing, I'm now free. <laughs> I'm free! It's never a thing you were being forced to do in the first place. Well, half of it was. <laughs> the first half was all my stuff. The second half was the stuff that my PhD supervisor was interested in and I didn't understand. <laughs> well, I didn't understand because I made it, but I didn't understand the point. Um, we'll get to that. I don't, I don't, don't get algebraic geometry. I'm sure, I'm sure it's very useful and handy and nice, but it's just never had it explained to me. I get the fundamental theorem of algebra. I get that it's named badly. Um, because it's really the fundamental theorem of algebraic geometry. I mean, there's a lot of things in mathematics where you look at it and go, that, that should be called something else, but we're stuck with this now. Like, any time I go into a physics, looking at physics stuff with things like torque and rotation, I'm just sitting here going, why did you put the negatives there? <laughs> That's stupid. It's fine. And I mean, some some of it makes sense. So like whenever you're talking about rotation, when we're doing things mathematically, we like to have start our rotation measurements with the x-axis because why not? But a lot of places start rotation with the north of the compass, which is our, our positive y-axis, which means you have to adjust everything. So that, that at least sort of makes sense. That, that is one thing um, with uh, various 3D software. So if you want to make a game in Unity, a 3D game, or if you want to make something in Blender, or what have you, there's no real consistency as to how to label the 3D axis. Um, generally speaking, whatever view you're looking at when you start, X is left and right, and that's nice. But there's no real understanding. It doesn't really matter, but there's no real understanding of like, okay, Z is up, and Y is forwards and backwards, because sometimes it's just Z's forwards and backwards, and Y is up, because they're like, well... As you're viewing it flat, looking forwards, that's the 2D plane, so that's X and Y, and then Z would be depth. Whereas other people would think, well, flat is flat horizontally, and up and down would be the depth, because usually when you draw something in 2D, it's on flat on a table. Um, flip the Y axis. <laughs> that's a different problem. <laughs> but I guess generally speaking, it, it shouldn't matter too much. Would it matter? Uh, it might matter to people who care about like, what's the what's the thing that you do with your hand when you're talking about fields? Isn't it to do with cross products or something? Yeah, there's the uh, right hand rule. E. I believe is what it's usually called because uh, there's a shorthand. You can use your right hand, your thumb, your pointer finger, and your uh, well, the rest of your fingers essentially. I guess you could use just your middle finger, but that might end up accidentally being rude. Um, you can use that to determine where thing, where some important things should be pointing. Something to do with the way that, yeah, taking, I don't know. <laughs> it's been a long time since I've had to think about vectors. Yeah, uh, well, it, it has since to I've do had to think about cross products of planes and where where is the normal pointing and where are things going. It's 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 a shorthand way of like, oh, I forgot the thing. It's it's like with the whole which side's the left, the hand that makes the L. So Which way is the hand that. facing when it does that? <laughs> there is that, yes. Uh, we're just up here, just going to do a quick little... I guess, do we want to talk about what these yeah, things I, I mean, actually it's, are? <laughs> it's, not, it's not like I'm trying to get this right. So <laughs> yeah, they, you well, there ahead. is that. <laughs> but I'm just sort of thinking, because it's like, you and I, like, I can explain what Man Whitney U is. And I'm pretty sure I can explain it in a way that you will understand. But I don't know if our audience <laughs> is going to be so thrilled about me prattling on about non-parametric statistical methods. Oh, we're in too deep at this point. It's fine. <laughs> go ahead. Okay. So there's a little bit of background that needs to go in here because technically Man Whitney U is a variant on another test. So for those in the audience, um, <clears throat> in statistics, uh, tests tests on numeric data, which is numbers that you can measure um, or count, typically fall into one of two categories. There's what we call parametric tests, which are usually piggybacking off of the idea that we're dealing with something that has a normal distribution, a normal distribution being something that looks sort of like this, the bell curve. Non-parametric tests don't 
rely on that. They basically go, right, we're not going to assume anything about what sort of distribution this has beyond the fact that we can order this information from smallest to largest and that what we call the median is going to be in the middle via that being the definition of the median. It's the number that has 50% of your data values that are greater than it and 50% that are less. Um, when you're dealing with continuous data, whether that's inclusive or exclusive, doesn't really matter. So we just sort of ignore it for the sake of simplicity. How and, dare you ignore things? <laughs> that's not math. I mean, there's too many numbers <laughs> and it doesn't change the values by much. So we're just kind of like, whatever, we don't care. If you have a continuum, I'm fine. It's, just don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah. It, this is usually dealing with either continuous data or data where there's so many possibilities, it might as well be continuous. So we'll just treat it as continuous. Mm, spherical cows. <laughs> yeah. 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 But with this, we have more justification for it because while the cow may not be spherical, the data that we're working with usually is bell shaped, uh, even if it's not like smoothly bell shaped. Um, but when you, you, well, when you don't have that, uh, then you do what are called non-parametric tests, where you do not assume anything about what's going on with the underlying probability distribution. In parametric tests, um, we have a test called a two-sample t-test, where you are comparing two populations and you are determining if their means are comparable or not. Um, essentially, what you're looking for is you're looking to see if the bell of one distribution sort of falls on top of it, or if they're sort of really separated from each other. <clears throat> Man Whitney U is the non-parametric equivalent to that, but on median. So essentially we're looking and saying, oh, we have these distributions. Are their medians sort of comparable or are their medians not comparable? And the way it does that is by using what's called um, ranks. So most non-parametric tests that are looking at medians go, well, the values essentially don't matter. Position does. And so what you do is you sort of rank all of your data collectively. So you take both data sets and you rank them from smallest to largest. And then you figure out how the large and small values compare when you split them back up into the two categories. So the idea is if, if these two distributions are sort of comparable, the number of low ranked data should be more or less the same and the number of high ranked data should be sort of the same in both distributions if you're numbering them from smallest to largest. Um, and Man Whitney U is one of the ways of sort of counting up and evaluating as a single number how equally distributed the ranks are between these two data sets. And basically, the closer it is to zero, the more evenly distributed the two values are, and the, the larger it is, the less evenly distributed the values are. Nice. Hopefully that made sense. <clears throat> <laughs> I probably did make sense. Uh, whether or not people listening uh, withdrew sense from it. Um, <laughs> that's a different matter, but that's that's a problem of education and attention span. Um, yeah. <laughs> so the fun thing is with this one in particular, um, there is another test called a Wilcoxon rank sum test that does the same thing. I'll put it on the test. Um, <clears throat> yeah, it, it does the same thing. And the fun thing is whether you find it or the Wilcoxon U is entirely irrelevant. Uh, because it's literally, it's it's a straight linear relationship. You can actually write out a formula uh, that says, okay, if you got this, you, you will get this. Oh, okay. So they're, they're logically equivalent up to some sort of transformation. Yeah, yeah entirely nice. logically equivalent. Uh, the fun thing is with some software that I use, even if it is uh, outputting the Wilcoxon rank sum, 
it will sometimes list it as the Man Whitney U because Wilcoxon put his name on like three different non-parametric tests, so that gets confusing. <laughs> Again, with a certain element of specificity of like, when we say people put their names on things, usually what happens is somebody proposes an idea, and if it turns out to be useful, people refer to it as, oh, that was the idea that came from this person, and then from that point on it just... That's what it becomes. You never name a thing after yourself. Well, most people don't name a thing after themselves. Um, it just sort of happens that way. It's very, very <laughs> gauche. Yeah, usually what happens <laughs> is, is they write a paper that has a very long, lengthy title and people just kind of go, right, this is an interesting idea, but I don't want to use all those descriptors every single time I'm talking about this idea, so I'm just going to name it after you. Yeah. Uh, this is my very quick doodly, Whitney Houston. Uh, singing I Will Always Love You. I will always love Houston. I don't understand any of that, but I appreciate the mood. <laughs> it makes a little bit more sense if you walk through the process, because it's a very systematic... It's a very systematic process to the point where it's like, okay, we could just program a computer to do that, and for the most part we do. Um, Computers are good at that sort of thing. Yes. Like, the only thing that takes a while, and these days it doesn't even take that long of a while unless you're dealing with a really long, large data set, is just ordering your numbers, because uh, it turns out that's not exactly a trivial problem, it's just a problem that we have enough processing power to not notice how untrivial it is. <laughs> Uh, as somebody who's one of his favorite areas of math is combinatorics, um, yeah, ordering numbers is a thing. Yeah, um. <laughs> I've, I, I've got computer science in my background, and there was a class where we spent a good third of our time talking about uh, different algorithms for sorting and programming them, and oh boy. Uh, though they did, the instructor did have a really neat visualization of how bubble sorting works, and that was neat to look at, at least. Nice. Um, bubble right. sorting being called because it's sort of, when you visualize it, the large or small numbers, depending on how you're sorting it, largest to smallest to smallest to smallest to largest, sort of bubble up to where they need to be. <clears throat> neat. There's lots of different sorting algorithms. If you go on YouTube and actually type in sorting algorithms, people come up with all sorts of fun visualizations for them. And some of them, they, they do it by like sound. So they sort of give the data from lowest to highest a tone. And as things get sort of moved around, tones happen. Um, or you can just watch the pretty colors go in the right order. Um, <laughs> but yeah, visualizations of sorting algorithms is, is, a, is very important because it turns out there's lots of ways to sort things and most of them are bad. Um, go notation and all that yeah like even if it's a thing where it's like okay this works it it takes a long time big o notation i think might have been the first area in uh, during the time of my university learning where i was like it doesn't feel like proper maths <laughs> You know, because it's like, the entire point of it is basically just to show this function grows like this. And so ba basically, let's take the thing that has the most, or th that will explode the most as the number gets big, and just ignore everything else. Yeah. And I kind of I kind of get the point. I get the point of that. But at the same time, my brain was like, that doesn't feel precise. <laughs> I mean, because it's not. It's but not. Yeah. Basically, the idea is what, when numbers are large enough and when you're doing large amounts of computations, that they are large enough, um, your exponential aspects of this equation are going to have a lot larger effect than your linear aspects of the equation to the point where the linear aspect is just, it might as well not be there. <clears throat> so if it might as well not be there when the numbers are large enough, we're just going to ignore it because it's not doing enough to be noticeable. Which you are right. It's not precise. It's an approximation. <laughs> yeah, see, I'm an algebraist. The word approximation is uh, anathema to me. Well, I mean, we do it a lot in <clears throat> a lot of the more applied side of things, partially because, uh, and there is... 
there's a theorem dealing with this. It had to do <clears throat> um, part of the reason why nonlinear dynamics became such a big thing. There's a lot of systems where it's not really feasible to get enough precise relevant information anyway. So we'll just look at the things that are having the largest effect, and then if we need to adjust, we will. <clears throat> uh, incidentally, that's why if you turn on the news, uh, your weather forecast isn't going to bother showing too many details about anything further out than maybe a week, um, because weather is a nonlinear dynamic and very chaotic system where slight changes in measurement, and by slight I mean, oh hey, we're measuring the temperature and we are like five tenths of a degree off because our measurement system only puts out so many decimal numbers, will affect what the system looks like further on down the line in, in a way that we cannot really predict. Chaos theory. Yay. It's a bugger. Actually, one of the um, lecturers in my department, uh, I'm not going to say accidentally, she was an applied mathematician. Um, but she wasn't intending to find this particular application to the stuff she was working on. Um, but she did help basically come up with an algorithm that's more efficient at working out long-term weather effects. And a la very large-scale long-term weather effects, like disasters, that sort of thing. Um, yeah, like, probably not useful for predicting what's, what's the temperature going to be like a, a Thursday five months from now. Yeah. Is this the same one? Oh no, that was a traveling lecture. There was another person who, who came in and talked about how they basically corrected physics because nobody bothered to check. Um, is it, uh, so um, in, in a microwave, you have a thing called a Faraday cage, um, which is, it stops the microwaves from spilling out in the sufficient quantities to cause you harm. Um, and basically, there was a book written by a very clever person, I think it might have been Feynman, um, and in the book they said, yeah, Faraday cages, they reduce the, uh, emissions of electromagnetic magnetic waves according to the inverse square law. And basically, for decades, people went, oh, that's true then. And then at some point somebody came along and went, well, why is it true? Because it, it doesn't give a proof or anything like that. And then they went to a bunch of microwave manufacturers and took their data, because they have to do, like, proper safety data you know they can't they can't work on theory they've got to do numbers um and they found out yeah no that's not true <laughs> turns out it's linear it's not it's not to do with the square um so uh, obviously your microwave's safe because it was tested with numbers not theory but there was just this sort of underlying mathematical incorrectness in this physics book that everyone went well Feynman's smart <laughs> so he knows what he's talking about um never assume somebody knows what they're talking about yeah, that happens a lot. Uh, I don't know what this is. <laughs> Slightly janky drawing of somebody with vaguely U-shaped glasses. Um, being a bodyguard for, I'm guessing, a mathematician? I guess it was specifically a statistician. Maybe actually they're the data collector. Because this, this is all about data and stuff like that. So we need somebody to protect the data collector while they're collecting the data from rogue... Algebraist I mean, other. hilariously enough, before <laughs> before things like um, RSA encryption became a thing, what a lot of businesses would do is they would literally fly their data in like briefcases and whatnot to whatever place was relevant with it. And yeah, you you have a security detail protecting the guy with the briefcase <laughs> because RSA encryption is not a thing yet. So this is the only secure way of sending it. Literally via plane. They still do that in, in like, if they have a huge amount of data to transfer, it is occasionally more cost effective to just drive it where they need it in a hard drive. Yeah, but that's because you don't want to wait five days for it to go over the Wi-Fi. Yeah. <laughs> You'd think they get Ethernet, really.
anyway, here's my my budding uh, mathematician bodyguard uh, romance front cover. <laughs> uh, soundtrack by Whitney Houston. And some shadows for dramatic effect. Um, <laughs> this is the thing. This is the thing I apparently drew. Um, it is definitely statistical. So, by which I, I mean, mean it's definitely isn't. relevant. <clears throat> so it might as well be statistically relevant. Well, yeah. I was going to call it a statistical anomaly, but th thank you for the <laughs> encouragement. <laughs> um, right. Your turn. What can I give you? I yes. have a list. Um, what will be fun? We should probably start. You probably you might know this one. Um, can, can you draw for me the baby monster? God, I love the names people come up with things when they're not just naming it after a person. <laughs> the baby monster, please. <laughs> the baby monster. The baby monster. All right. Well, I mean, obviously, it's a baby that's a monster. It's a baby monster. Uh, is it a baby that's a monster or is it a monster that's a baby? <clears throat> All babies are monsters, I think. <laughs> I don't want to get too <laughs> controversial here. Well, when you're dealing with something that has human brain hardware, but no software installed yet. <laughs> that's, that's a nice way of thinking about it. <laughs> and you can't just stick in a USB stick and install the software overnight. You've got to take like 18 years to install it all. And even then... What I'm saying is it's, it's a, sort of understandable. It's a very long installation process, isn't it? Yeah, it takes even longer than downloading the entirety of the Nintendo 3DS and Wii U shop. <laughs> Isn't the 3DS uh, shop shutting down soon? Yeah. In like a week. Um, but uh, the completionist and his little group uh, went through the trouble of preserving as much as possible. Mm -hmm. uh, so they they bought and downloaded <clears throat> every single game and DLC that was still on the eShop. <laughs> that doesn't sound like something the completionist would do at all. <laughs> and uh, it took them over a year. <laughs> because of various things to make it very difficult to buy and download the games. Including, uh, for some reason, on the 3DS there are multiple games with DLC, but you can't buy their DLC from the shop, you have to buy them from within the game. <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah, that was a bad decision. But yeah, at, at this point it's a... You're you're probably better off soft modding your 3DS and uh, finding other avenues. <laughs> we'll quote, leave it like other that. avenues. <laughs> unquote. <laughs> yeah, I was oh. considering I was watching Barry play the um, Professor Layton games. I was like, oh, I kind of want to play these. These seem fun. And apparently they're going to be gone soon. <laughs> yep. And while there are some of the games on the 3DS that you can get on other systems, there's a lot of them you can't. Mm. So, like, there is a Dungeon Crawler series that I'm <clears throat> fairly big fan of uh, called um, Etrian Odyssey mm -hmm. that was for the DS and 3DS but now they've been working on porting um, at least the older versions I think they're sort of working through the library to Steam so it's one of those things of like okay at, at, at least I can get this somewhere 
even if I can't get it here anymore. It at least exists. Um, but there's other stuff that uh, does not. So, <gasps> look at that smile. <laughs> The toothy smile! <laughs> uh, I guess I should explain what the baby monster is while I'm here. Um, so the baby monster is a surprisingly very important um, thing in group theory. Um, so group, the group, I'll talk more about groups on Wednesday when I attempt to explain my thesis. Um, but one of the things in groups is that you can break them down if you can find uh, little smaller groups inside your group and uh, specifically if they're normal that's one of those words that crops up everywhere in maths and means something completely different everywhere <laughs> but yep. anyway if you have a normal <clears throat> subgroup you can break your group up into smaller components so people are interested in the ones where you can't do that what are the smallest ones you can't break down what are the building blocks of all of the other groups basically and so they tried to classify them all and there's some that are do have the fit in a nice pattern like the cyclic groups and the alternating groups and all that sort of stuff but there are some that are just random that we, we just need because there's no other way of making them and th there are a few of them i think there are like 30 of them that are just there for reasons we don't really understand they're just there um and the second biggest one of those is the baby monster so called because it was found inside the biggest one called the monster um, <laughs> uh, for reference, the number of elements in the monster is four times ten to the thirty-three. Um, so that's roughly four with thirty-three zeros after it. Um, its <laughs> its smallest representation, i.e., its smallest way of being written as a, a, a matrix group, um, the matrices have to be four thousand three hundred and seventy uh, by four thousand three hundred and seventy. Um. Oh boy. So I, I did some graph theory research in grad school. Um, basically, I was looking at line graphs of graphs and their line graphs. So making line graphs of line graphs. Lovely. Uh, and we were trying to determine if there was some sort of pattern inherent with uh, line graphs of line graphs of trees, specifically. Um, mm -hmm. And you can summarize a... Uh, well, actually, technically, both a directed and undirected graph with a matrix of ones and zeros, <clears throat> which makes it very easy to automate <laughs> making a matrix of the line graph of that tree. Um, but the uh, graphs, uh, the, the matrices became very, very large. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and despite the fact that these are sparse matrices, I, uh, uh, I crashed the computer. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you when you're trying to do a representation like that, you need to uh the 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 most sensible logical way of doing it usually ends up making things explode. <laughs> you have to be canny, which is why the representation theory field exists and that's where I worked for my PhD. Um yeah. Uh Now granted, I wasn't using like a supercomputer or anything to do this. Uh but it's still one of those things of like, oh, uh, I need to put you out of your misery and just unplug you and <laughs> shut you down. Oh, I've done this many times. <laughs> My poor laptop. Um. Now, see, I, I do find it funny that this is called the monster, though, because um, <clears throat> in fractals, a lot of curves that we now know as fractals were called monsters oh. because... At the time, it was like, right, th this is this is a curve. We've defined it as such that it should be a curve, but it's doing something weird, and They're we weird don't know things. how to analyze that <laughs> yet. So we're just going to call them monsters and make this someone else's problem. Uh, so I just looked up the monster group. I wanted to see how the baby monster compared. The baby monster had uh, the order of magnitude 33. Um, the monster is order of magnitude 53. Um, so, it's a bit bigger, isn't it? Apparently the monster is also called the Friendly Giant. That's quite nice. <laughs> That's a lot nicer than calling it the monster. Uh, a minimal degree <clears throat> of a faithful complex representation of the monster is 196,000 dimensions. <laughs> 
Oh, Jesus Christ. That's a big matrix. Um, so just to specify, when I'm talking about a matrix of dimension 196,000, what I mean is a 196,000 by 196,000 grid of numbers. And every element of which there are eights with 53 zeros, um, every single one of those needs one of those matrices attached to it. <laughs> I mean, you can, you can find generators for the group, so you don't need to specify all of them, but... So it's going to be a lot. It's big. It's a big mm. thing. That's why it's called the monster. Go to the monster. I think it's got something to do with Rubik's cubes, like the the um the the, the group associated with manipulating a Rubik's cube is sits inside the monster somewhere. I think might be wrong. That's just a really fun sentence. <laughs> Like with, with or without context, that's just a really fun sentence. <laughs> but yeah, th this is just one of those things where it's like, often in maths, you want you want things to to be neat. You want things to have a, a structure to them, and and so they kind of wanted that for groups because groups are so general. They're they're just so abstract. They they can apply to almost every other area of maths if you find a use for it. Um. That they just assumed, oh, okay, well, these, these finite building blocks, they should be, they should follow patterns, and most of them do. But then you just got these, like, uh, 26 or whatever, how many, let me find, uh, sporadic, finite, simple groups. Oh, yeah, the, the classification, so there, the, the, the theorem of the classification of the finite simple <clears throat> groups is one of the longest theorems, because it was... Uh, yeah, here we are. The proof consists of tens of thousands of pages and several hundred journal articles written by about a hundred authors between 1955 and 2004. <laughs> That's a big, big theorem. This was not neat. They wanted it to be neat. It was not neat. <laughs> um, and yeah, I you mean, just end up with things like the monster. It's just like, we to, need that. To, to, to a certain extent, I don't know why this surprised anyone, seeing as what happened <laughs> when they tried to prove that one plus one is two. Yeah, that took a while. <laughs> Like, after a certain point, you just have to sit there and go, oh, well, I mean, I say that, but also I, I the the research I did, we started with the idea of like, oh, we'll just deal with all trees. And then it's like, nope, nope, <laughs> we got one case done. <laughs> ah, miss, this is the baby monster. They're big. I like them. <laughs> Oh yeah, 26. I, I did remember correctly. There are 26 sporadic finite simple groups. It's just weird that we just need those, I guess. <laughs> and there are finitely many of them. That's weird. That's weird that there are only finitely many that don't fit into another pattern. You would think, you would think in, in most of these situations it's either there's a lovely neat thing or everything's awful. And here it's just finitely many things are awful. This has always stuck in my head, <laughs> ever since the you know, first year group theory lecture. Also, I find it interesting that there's 26 of them. 26? <laughs> it's weird, isn't it? <laughs> What's the smallest one? I don't know what the smallest one is. Uh, the biggest one's the monster. Well, the baby <laughs> the monster seems to be back, at least. <laughs> the baby, yeah, baby monster's having a great time. <laughs> Uh, low person here for scale. <clears throat> two rank. What does that mean? Oh, I guess two generators. Um, you show me the. the there are twenty six of them. Tell me them. <laughs> Give me them. List of finite simple groups. Here we go. What have we got? <laughs> Cyclic groups, alternating groups, Chevrolet groups. Steinberg, Suzuki, Ray, and Tits. Don't forget the Tits group. Um, yeah, monster group. So, okay, the smallest one is apparently seven and a half thousand elements. That's the first one that doesn't fit into a pattern. And then it just keeps getting bigger. <laughs> yep, which is why I have made this, uh, despite the oh. fact that it's a baby monster. <laughs> we have scale. <laughs> I just noticed. <laughs> 
Should have played with the Duolingo math scores. <laughs> Oh, I'll probably get things wrong. More, more, <laughs> more information about my inability to do maths uh, coming in a video soon. <laughs> I mean, as long as you're not doing maths so badly that you think the world is, that the circumference of the globe is like half the size that it actually is. Fun fact: that was Columbus's justification for why he could be, why he should be able to sail across the Atlantic and end up in India. He did his math right. badly. That makes sense. <laughs> Which is why no one really wanted to fund him. Because at that point, the size of the globe was a fairly well-known fact. <laughs> yeah, the ancient Greeks worked that out pretty accurately, didn't they? Yeah. And uh, there's at least a handful of Indian mathematicians who were able to calculate it within like a couple of miles. Uh, people are smart. <laughs> People are smart, did you know that? And I believe there were some Greek and Egyptian mathematicians who were able to figure out the curvature, <clears throat> which is a related feature. But yeah, basically he just sort of went around and went, I I can do this thing and everyone <laughs> and every and, and 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 at every royal place that people there who like actually know things were like no, get out of here. Uh, <laughs> so he had to go over to Spain, which is not the country that he's from. Uh, and if I remember correctly, at the time, Italy and Spain were not on good terms. <laughs> that sounds about right. My favorite sort of historical math be bad thing story was when that guy incidentally tried to patent something that would have ended up making pi legally 3.2 <laughs> and it was like it got really far it got really far down the legal process before a mathematician came in and said what is this <laughs> why why are you doing this <laughs> I can't remember the exact thing they were trying to do. He wasn't actually trying to say, oh, oh well, he was trying to square the circle. He was trying to patent his proof of squaring the circle, which you can't do. Um, that's subsequently been proved to be impossible. But <laughs> I, yeah, I mean, was... there's approximations you can find of pi that make use of squares, but... <clears throat> and sometimes those approximations are good enough. Just depends on what you're doing. So yeah, it, it, there was an alternate timeline in which a mathematician did not happen upon this thing, and at some point in American law, pi would have been three point two. It probably, it would have been very quickly changed, but you can cut a square out of a pi. People would be very annoyed though. That's an awkward shape to cut out of a pi. <laughs> Unless it's your pi, yeah. in which case you can do whatever you want. But yeah, if it's a personal pi. I don't think anyone cares, though. There are. You you can make pi like things square shaped. Yeah, I was gonna say pi doesn't have to be circular. So it just it as far as I'm aware, the circle mostly makes it easier to shape and makes it easier hmm. to make sure that everything is cooked consistently throughout. Yeah. Because basically, if you've got something that has corners, the corners end up uh, crispy. <clears throat> well, that's a big monster. <laughs> big, big, big monster. Big baby monster. Uh, right. Do, do you have more for me? Yeah. Let me just <clears throat> grab. Give me some statistics, which is a sentence I've never said before in my life. Um... Let's see. <clears throat> Trying to grab one of these that is one interesting. Because <clears throat> a lot of the tests are either named after the distribution, which are mostly just letters. Yeah. So we've got like Z and T and Chi, which, <clears throat> yes, indeed, is just a letter, um, and F. <laughs> So key like if F you follow. Distribution. And, and we have W distribution. Uh, 
Okay. Uh, <clears throat> let's go with Kendall Tao. K Ken Kendall Tao. Okay. Kendall. All right. Okay. So Barbie's boyfriend. Uh. <laughs> I will never shush about Kingdom Hearts nonsense. It's nonsense, I tell you. <clears throat> uh, Tau. Tau, uh, that makes me think of Warhammer. The, there are the Tau, uh, who are a, a race of people in Warhammer, who have cool helmets. I like them. They also have mechs, which I, I'm indifferent towards. Hey, um, let's draw a mech. I'm going to draw a mech. No, I'm not going to draw a mech. <clears throat> Um, what I will draw is a Tau with um, a buff Ken doll body. <laughs> That's what I'm going to do. This is sensible, right? Cheeb's not here. Somebody's got to draw a tits. Um... All the tits. <clears throat> I mean, I'm sure there's something we could come up with where it's the, the shortening of it is just tits. Beyond... Um... The so, one you've already mentioned. The, the tits cone and the tits group, or teats, strictly. Um, there are those. Um, I did, uh, among my list of other things that I might have suggested would have been um, the ass primes. Um, which are, the ass stands for associated. Um, but uh, they, they, they write it ASS, so. <clears throat> but you arrive at drawing tits. Hi, Chib! Tits abound. Um... Look, mathematicians don't like to write out words if we can avoid it, so we shorten things down. Uh, and sometimes those shortening things down are, are unfortunate. Hey, Chip. How's it, Chip? Daylight come and we want to go, Chip. I think we all do it on purpose. Yeah, some of us do. I bet Conway did. Conway named the baby monster, by the way. I should specify. If you, had, I'm assuming you know who Conway is. That is an assumption. Uh, Conway is a famous mathematician who he was one of those mathematicians who was a general mathematician. He just sort of did whatever his interest piqued him. Um, and he's probably best known for the game of life. Um, well, Conway's game of life, I should specify, not the board game. Um, which is the thing where you have pixels, some of which are alive and some of which are dead, and if you have enough living ones around you, it something becomes alive, like a birth or whatever, and if you have too many around you, you die because you don't have enough resources. And very interesting systems happen with different setups, and it turns out it's Turing complete. It's, it's weird. Um... But he also actually did some really, really cool stuff, including all the script theories. Not the board game, no, no, no. Look up um, uh, Conway's Game of Life. There's some cool animations and stuff. People doing decent things. Um, yeah, basically, I, I sort of remember that one. Basically, you're sort of expanding on what we already know with things like... Um, <clears throat> I would have just had the phrase. I talked about it just a couple weeks ago in class. Uh, um, it, basically, whenever you've got any sort of population, there's always some sort of limiting factor to how much it can grow. Hmm. And that has to do with like how much can the surroundings support. Um, and this relates to both like anything that can grow. So... And this is one of the reasons why whenever I look at any sort of company who goes, we're going to grow, 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 I'm just sort of sitting here going like, mm, that's <laughs> not going to work. Um, because basically any sort of growth, any sort of useful growth model, there's going to be a limiting factor. Um, and that limiting factor is going to be how much of this can be supported. Uh, this is why any sort of longstanding company will also sell other things beyond their big ticket items with basically the idea being that you only need one washer dryer 
And if the manufacturer is competent, you're not going to be buying another one of those for a while. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so instead of just selling washer and dryers, the washer dryer company also sells, we can, we can fix your washer dryer. If something happens, we can do maintenance. <clears throat> and that's where most of their day-to-day -day money is going to come from because you can't support selling more and more and more washers and dryers. Nice tits, thank you very much. Has he considered making a board game? Probably. He made he made a completely different group of numbers called the Surreal Numbers and wrote a novel about them. <laughs> Actually, no, did he write the novel? No, no, it was someone else. He made the numbers, somebody else wrote the novel. Anyway. Um, the Surreal Numbers are really interesting, because they include the real numbers, but they also include the number that isn't real that's closest to zero that's positive. Well, it's not positive, because it's not a real number, but... And, and what is positive and negative when you're dealing with numbers that aren't real? <clears throat> well, it's, the, the, the surreal numbers are linear, which is interesting. They're not complex, because they're not defined oh. algebraically. They're defined by proximity. It's a weird system. It's kind of interesting. <laughs> it's all to do with... You, you, you define a number by defining the numbers around it. Huh. So zero mm. is defined, zero is the first number, it's defined as the number that's around the, the empty set, <laughs> basically. It's just whatever's around, so long as it's even, you know, equal on both sides, you've got zero in the middle. So you've got zero, and then you define one as being having zero on the left and the empty set on the right, and minus one is zero, zero on the right, the empty set on the left. Uh, and then you can define a half as having zero on the left and one on the right. Um, and it sort of keeps going like that. And then you can get all the real numbers that way. And also lots of other numbers, <laughs> like one over infinity, basically. Um, that is actually a really interesting way of defining numbers. It is. I recommend looking it up. He's, he's, he's got some good talks on it. Um... Because from like an education standpoint, part of the issue that I run into is that students sometimes don't have a good feel for like what numbers are relative to each other. So you'll get, especially when dealing with fractions, they're just really bad at telling when how to compare two fractions to each other. <laughs> but something like yeah. that it sort of forces you to build some level of number sense of understanding of how numbers relate to each other because y you have to. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, the problem with that is that in order to define a third, I think you need to have like infinitely many numbers. <laughs> well, yeah, because uh, 10 is not divisible by three. So you're, you're going to have multiple decimals and it's not divisible by three in such a way you have infinitely many decimals. Well, well you don't, in surreal numbers, you don't, it's not really, because you're sort of d dealing with a left and a right, you're not really dealing with decimal. You're dealing more with binary, almost. Um, so you just have to keep defining it. I think it's something like, it's less, it's, it's, it's to the left of a half, but to the right of a quarter, but to the left of three eighths, but to the right of, it, it, it's something like that. You keep bouncing backwards and forwards between all of these. Yeah, it's basically you're defining it how you would define it in terms of a binary decimal, which technically yeah. to represent it, you need an infinite number of decimals. Yeah. Because of how three, well, I should say because of how a third relates to both base 10 and base two. The cheap how do tids work? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> like abs. I go for a Ken doll sort of thing. Um, you I mean, wear the hilariously game. cheap. That is the simplest practical definition I have seen for why one plus one is equal to two. Because you hold, you, you represent one by holding up one finger, you represent one by holding up one finger, and one finger next to one finger looks a whole heck of a lot like two fingers being held up together. Yep. And thus you have defined a correspondence between the abstract and the physical. Now there's a lot of mathematicians who won't be, who, who won't necessarily settle for that sort of definition. 
But yep. that is the simplest <laughs> one that instead, I have seen. <laughs> instead, they will spend 150 pages of proof of the most dense mathematical proof you ever did see. Um, I tried to read it once. <laughs> It's a time. I'm perfectly happy understanding that numbers are a thing. Um, I don't necessarily need a proof of that. I'll take set theory yeah. as it is, thanks. <laughs> but I can understand why people would be interested in that. Um, okay. Yeah, well, I mean, it, even, even if you're doing it from a quote-unquote practical standpoint and not a we're playing fun number game standpoint <laughs> just knowing that there's not a hole somewhere that we're going to fall into eventually with the work we're doing and the logic that we're doing is nice well because just just because it's worked <laughs> so far doesn't wanna, mean it will work in all cases i want to watch it jim i don't have time um th there is um uh what's his name Oh, it's his name. He's got cool hair. We had cool hair. He's dead. Uh... <laughs> ah, Girdle. Girdle's incompleteness theorem. There is that. Um, which is one of my favorite theorems. Because it basically says, hey, mathematicians, there's a little chaos pixie floating above your head and they might trip you up at any moment and you'll never know. <laughs> um... That's the technical term. Uh, no, it's, it's basically so. In order to prove anything in maths, uh, you start with axioms, you start with assumptions, and from that you build up. Those assumptions can be anything so long as they're consistent, um, which is which is what makes maths so useful. Because a scientist can come along and say, "Hey, we've got these laws of physics. Prove something," and we're like, "Great, we can do that." And then they come along a hundred years later and go, "Actually, those laws of physics were wrong. Here's new laws of physics." And we're like, "Great, we'll use those instead." Um, but. And and I was talking about, you know, uh, the proof of one plus one is two, taking God knows how long and many, many pages. That was done, or one of those attempts, was done by Whitehead and Russell, I believe, Principia Mathematica, um, in an attempt to basically go, right, this is how we're going to start maths. All of maths is going to start here, and we're going to be able to answer every question we can from this starting point. Um... Which was an admirable thing to want to do. And then Girdle came along and said, yeah, that's impossible. Um, and came along with his um, incompleteness theorem, which says that regardless of which areas, of, regardless of which axioms you choose, if your area of maths is sufficiently complicated, and by sufficiently complicated he means you can count, because <laughs> that's maths's idea of complication, uh, if you could do that, then there will be a statement in your area of maths which is true, but which it is impossible to prove is true um, using the axioms you have. And so that would be then another axiom you could add to your set of axioms. But then there would be another statement in that new area of maths that can't be proved but is true, and so, so on and so forth. And nobody will ever actually be able to really tell when that happens, because... There are things like the Riemann hypothesis, which they've been trying to prove for about 150 years now, and they haven't. And it might just be one of those things where it's like, it's true, but you can't prove it. Um, no one knows yet. Yeah. People have spent their entire careers trying, and maybe it's pointless. <laughs> Chaos Pixie. Because you don't know if it's like, right, is this true in all cases, or have we just not found evidence of where it doesn't work exactly they found billions and billions and billions of examples where it does work but they haven't found one where it doesn't but that's not good enough for scientists that's good enough for mathematicians no yeah my my personal favorite example of a case like that where it's like we're pretty sure it's always true but we haven't found a way to prove it's true and it's driving people so nuts that we're coming up with variants of this problem to play with because we keep getting <laughs> stuck. Um, is the... Oh god, was it 3n plus 1 or 2n plus 1? Oh, I know what you're talking about, yeah. I think it's 2n plus 1. <laughs> Or 
Hold on. I need to go through the numbers to figure <laughs> out. Is it? The snowballing. I, can't, uh, I think it might be three and plus one. It's 11 minutes, but you give at least one useful tip. I, oh, I can watch. I want to watch. I just haven't had time. Remind me. I'm going to set a reminder for not tomorrow because I'm busy. But some other time. Yeah, three and plus one. The the two thing is dividing by two. So uh, yeah. basically, it started out with like, okay, we have this number problem, and you're going to start with an integer, any integer, and you have two rules. If the integer is divisible by two, divide it by two. If it's not divisible by two, uh, multiply it by three and add one. And then take that new number and do that process again. And do it again and again and again and again and again. And what people found with these is, is like, hey, after a while, you end up stuck in this same cycle of numbers just here at the bottom. And then it's like, well, <clears throat> okay, is, is that always going to happen? Uh, and we don't know. They've They've shown it works for a lot of numbers, um, and I think they someone even managed to find an upper bound of anything below this number it will work for. Ooh, nice. But they they haven't gotten beyond that. And yeah, so and because people are silly. Uh, by the way, I looked it up. It's the Colatz conjecture, is what it's called. That's the one. And basically, it's just kind of like, right, so we, we've proven it for all of these numbers, but we ran into a snag, so what are we going to do? Well, we've got nothing better to do, so let's see what happens if we're doing with negative integers. <laughs> and that's when you know people have too much time on their hands. I, I like the one with the Riemann hypothesis, is people have started making maths assuming it's true. They're just like, well, this is taking a while to prove, so let's just assume it's true. <laughs> and then see what happens if we assume it is. Um, running on the assumption that at some point somebody isn't going to come along and go, oh, actually, it wasn't true. <laughs> and thus all of their work will be wasted. So, so potential proof by contradiction, but with a delay. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Good news! I managed to disprove the Riemann hypothesis. Bad news! The last 50 years of my life were wasted. <laughs> Welcome to maths, everybody. <laughs> Proof is hard. <laughs> uh, I'm spending way too much time on these. Don't worry yeah. about it. I mean, negative information is still information. But, this, yeah, this was the thing... Sense. But I had a conversation with my um, PhD supervisor about this is, is whether or not people should publish negative ah, it's October. whether or not people should publish negative findings um, because almost all publications in maths are, we proved a thing but quite often when you're doing maths you, you tend to disprove a hypothesis you tend to go, okay I think this is what's going to happen and let's, let's experiment, let's work things out let's go through the proof, see if it works and quite a lot of the time you go, oh no that didn't work and wouldn't it be nice, wouldn't it be nice if you could save another mathematician the bother of doing that? <laughs> By going, hey, yeah. we tried this and we proved that it wasn't, <laughs> it, that, that wasn't the case. And then you never tell anyone. <laughs> so they have to work it out too. Yeah, well, um, and see, that's why I, I'm coming from more the static statistics and applied side of things. We we publish stuff where it's like we tried a thing, it didn't work all the time. And uh, basically it's one of those things of usually what happens is you you try and sort of conjecture up some ideas of why things might have gone wrong and then either analyze that that later or someone else analyzes it later. So it's like, okay, well these these things didn't work <laughs> now we have an additional question of why did that not work? Um, Don't judge also, my life choices, Kira. Things, <laughs> there's just a lot of things in statistics where, like, it's very, very rare in statistics that we say something is for sure true. We just say that there's evidence 
of some relationship, but we very rarely say what that relationship really is. Oh, yes, yeah, statistics is like by design one of the only areas of mathematics where you can do all of your maths 100% correct and get the wrong answer. <laughs> because it just it just happened not to be. <laughs> you know, we ha we have our model, it's a good model, it works for modeling what's happening and oh, it turned out that the most likely thing didn't happen because the universe. <laughs> Yeah. And it's like you've got a you got a tough time. You got a tough time in that area. This is why I like algebra. <laughs> Cuz it oh, may be I guess speaking of statistics, I guess I should probably explain what Kendall Tao is. Oh yeah, yeah, tell me what about tell me about Kendall Tao. So, uh Kendall Tao is again another non-parametric method. So again, we're dealing with not raw data but rank data. Rank being saying basically if you ordered this data set, where is it in order? So we're not we don't care what the value is, we just care about its relative position in the set. Um, and Kendall Tau is a way at looking at regression. So in parametric statistics, uh, so regression is talking about what is sort of the model function relationship between two numeric data sets. So you've got a bunch of plots pointed, and the question is, is there some sort of systematic equation that describes generally how the dots relate um, with different observations, generally. Unfortunately, when you're dealing with parametric data, you, it mainly is useful for figuring out either lines or things we can transform into line. So it's really great for picking up whenever we've got data that is set up um, <clears throat> in these sort of nice positive and negative line relationships. Kendall's tau, Kendall tau <clears throat> goes right, we're going to remove we're going to remove value but keep position, which means that we're able to find things that are not just linear but uh, monotonic, which I think that's the right word. Um, basically the whole idea of monotonicity, I think again, I think that's the right word. I'd have to double check is we are always increasing or always decreasing, but we're not saying how we're increasing or decreasing. So now we can use this to more accurately determine uh, there's definitely an increasing relationship when we're dealing with something that's, say, exponential. <clears throat> so it looks more sort of like this. <clears throat> uh, which a... Uh, which a parametric test looking for linear relationships wouldn't necessarily catch. <clears throat> Now, it's, you can technically use it to catch linear relationships, but because of how non-parametric tests work, if you're dealing with parametric data, it's going to be worse at picking up relationships with parametric data than just doing the parametric test. I was just thinking, so, imagine somebody walking into the stream now. <laughs> yeah, we have a buff, buff robot dude and a, and a bunch of crosses with dots on them. <laughs> an explanation of statistical methods. <laughs> it's like, yeah, this is what I expected on Twitch.tv. <laughs> yeah, so I, I sort of realized I was supposed to be doing a Ken doll, but I gave it like articulated toes. I don't think that's a Ken doll thing. <laughs> Anyway, Ragdoll, you're Ragdoll, you're wrong. This is Kendall Tao. <laughs> um, all that statistic stuff is a misnomer. Um, it's the new Warhammer 40k Tao model. Um, they're trying to get a different demographic buying their stuff. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, they're not usually that articulated. I also went with like articulated fingers as well. I'm not sure why. Um, because I didn't want to draw hands, I guess. <laughs> so I just drew a bunch of squares. Um, I'm just, I'm just thinking if this is supposed to be like a Warhammer 40k model, those <laughs> things aren't very big. Well, what's that? That one that came out recently that you buy it in bits at each bit's like 200 quid or something. Um. Yeah, but I'm just imagining trying to get some sort of ball joint 
figurine that small. <laughs> yeah, this one. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> I, I'm imagining it's that size. <laughs> That's huge. That that's a there is a storage closet for just that in particular. <laughs> Wrist joints for a Barbie doll? I don't know. I never had these. <laughs> My knowledge is minimal <laughs> of Ken dolls. They look like this, right? <laughs> Barbie has wrist joints. There, see? Why can't Ken? I mean, Why can't Ken have a wrist? You could also go with like the G.I. Joe figures those usually had a bit more articulation in various places it wasn't necessarily good <clears throat> articulation because <clears throat> with the um hip joint it was essentially just like you could turn it but it's now like we've got ovals that are <laughs> ovals that are facing different directions now <clears throat> anyway like... kendall tau is here to talk to you about this uh, probability distributions <clears throat> Action Man has loads of articulation. That's why it's Action Man. He can action. Uh, right, Ragdoll, do you want to draw a thing? Sure. <clears throat> uh, what can I give you? Um, I want to give you that, but it's it's basically the monster again. Um, <laughs> I mean, like I said, there's a lot of fractals that were called monsters. True. Uh, I talked about ass primes. Um, <clears throat> What would make a good drawing? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> okay, this is, this is, let's see what you can do with this. Draw, can draw, draw an annihilator ideal. Annihilator ideal. An okay. annihilator ideal. <clears throat> Alternatively, you can do the one that was connected to the monster, which was monstrous moonshine. <laughs> <laughs> that's just a really big cup of moonshine <laughs> I think that was like somebody had a theory about the monster group and somebody else came along and went that's that's nonsense, that's moonshine, it's terrible and then it turned out to be true so they called it monstrous moonshine <laughs> um, dolls change a lot still depending on the line of dolls and manufacturers, the old Barbie dolls when you were a child had hip joints and elbow joints and that was it just hip and elbow not shoulder <laughs> Yeah. I like I, mean, I like that idea. Of... The, the... <laughs> Bobby's like a penguin, just <laughs> flapping arms around. <laughs> Hip and shoulder. Ah, that's no. I prefer my idea. <laughs> I mean, it sort of depended on the Barbie. Like a lot of the Barbies I had as a kid did have just the shoulder and hip, um, and then head. But there was one Barbie I had that came with a bike, and you could put it on the put her on the bike and like roll the bike around, put her feet into the pedals and roll the bike around, and her legs would move. Um, and Thanks. so she had articulation for both shoulder and elbow, and then hip and knee. And I think she also had articulation in the feet. Head, shoulder, hip, and knee. I still have that bike around somewhere because my mother used it to talk about uh, the relationship between linear and rotational speed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, because basically if you've got a bike traveling, you've got the front wheel and the back wheel, which are sort of traveling the same way. But the back wheel is attached to the gear where your foot is. And since those are attached by a chain, the back wheel and the gear are moving the same. There's like a similar speed there because the chain is attached and obviously the chain isn't moving different speeds across the two wheels. But the gear in the middle and the wheel in the back are different sizes. So... <clears throat> Let's see. They're very upset that Monster High came out where you were too grown up to, go, uh, to buy them. Lots of uh, lots of articulation. I think I've just looked up some pictures. A lot going on. Very, very 
sort of halfway, I would, I would describe them as halfway between Barbie and Bratz. <laughs> Barbie's a game with vehicles, got more articulation. What about an articulated lorry? <clears throat> so Jürgen ends up with only hip and elbow articulation. Ah, oh, can I animate Jürgen running around like a penguin? Doll I mean, I don't think anyone would stop you from trying. Yeah. <laughs> well, cheap me, but I don't know. <laughs> and then I can intersperse that with footage from Doctor Who of Bill asking the Twelfth Doctor, why do you run like a penguin with its ass on fire? What may you stop me from? From animating Jürgen running like a penguin. With only hip and elbow articulation. <laughs> Yeah, don't. Aww. <laughs> Fine. Fine, I will keep having time to do other things. <laughs> do it. No! <laughs> I, I like how Miss and she just sort of switch back and forth between who's the shoulder devil and who's the shoulder angel. <laughs> it's, it's contextual. They're morally articulated. Um, you have time to do that, but don't have time to watch a video. I'm gonna watch the video. Do it, Chris. <laughs> Add it to the list. It can't hurt just adding it to the you list. You know he doesn't consume media that's from this century. Mm. I'm not adding it to the list. The list is long enough. Although I'm coming up very soon, very soon, I'm coming up to the end of a big thing on the list, so. And you will all know what it is and look at me and go, why? <laughs> Looking forward to that. Um, yeah, I don't know what you, I don't know what you want to draw with an annihilator ideal. Um, <laughs> I mean, I'm right now I'm drawing a giant cannon. Nice. Of some sort. Or maybe a laser. I don't know. Feels rather weapony, sort of um, Terminator sort of thing springs to mind. Jürgen has all the joints canonically, all individual toe joints probably. Well, we won't know that until you draw them. Wiggling. All the joints plus two secret joints. Hmm. Well. I mean, it is canon that it, he is a child and hasn't really grown up, and kids, infants in particular, do technically have more bones because they haven't fused yet. Yeah. <laughs> no, I don't want that. I'm just stating a fact. Um, uh, does the nose spin? That might be a joint. <laughs> well, the, the both ears spin. There we go. That's two secret joints. Which is funny, because those are usually cartilage, which are not really jointy. These are individual parts. There you go! <clears throat> Jürgen can customize his ears. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll give it a, while I'm here. Brief explanation of uh, what an Annihilator ideal is. Uh, Do it cheap. <laughs> draw the puppet's feet. Misses now the devil on cheap's shoulder. Um, so an ideal, this is from ring theory, or well, strictly speaking, is from representation theory. Uh, <clears throat> so you yeah, have... The, the ideal thing sort of clued me in on that one a little bit. Um, yeah, so an ideal is... Generally, I'll, I'll give the simpler <laughs> version. Um, an ideal is basically, uh, if you have a ring, so for example, um, numbers, numbers, a ring, you can add them and multiply them and they do good things. Um, a, a ring is essentially a small part of, oh, sorry, an ideal is a small part of those where if you were to take an element and then any other element in the big ring and 
conjugate, which is basically apply on the left one way and apply on the right backwards. So, for example, multiply on the left by two and multiply on the right by a half. Um, you would end up with another element of uh, the original set. <clears throat> so you you can't get out of that set, which is why it's an ideal. It's sort of stuck in and of itself. You can't get out of it. Why would you want to leave? It's ideal. Um, the example I gave of numbers is trivial because they're commutative. But um, anyway, that's an ideal. <clears throat> and a annihilator ideal is when instead of the ring acting on itself, you have a module that's acting on it and uh, it arises as the annihilator of a sub ring, uh, sorry, of a sub module. Um, so there's some sort of. Actually, I think you can just do it with an element of the module. Uh, that if the module element acts on the ideal, everything just dies, everything goes to zero. Um, which is why they call it an annihilator. <laughs> so basically, it's just an ideal that if you if that there is an element in the action acting module that just kills everything. Um, so that's fun. <laughs> it's just got a silly name. It's an annihilator ideal. And turns out it's a big old laser. I just find it funny that we give these like catastrophic names to just. Silly little number games. <laughs> I mean, literally, one of the other things on my list was catastrophe theory. Um, but I didn't know how you would draw that, so... <laughs> thought annihilator ideal might be slightly easier. It's like a little control box of some sort. <laughs> the world's largest laser pen. Oh, God. <laughs> got confused there. I thought you drew two circles and then a couple of dots. And I was like, oh, it's like a clock. And then you drew more dots. I'm like, that's not what a clock does. Nope. Need control panel. <gasps> but I was wearing the dress you got of an AC. No. Oh. Nice. Uh, I still have. Adorable little. Programmed babies. <laughs> there needs to be some sort of explosion over here as well. It's on fire. Yeah, okay, sorry, I got the definition of... Annihilator ideal slightly wrong. I'm sure you are all about to j jump in and correct me. Um, it doesn't have to be an ideal um, of elements which annihilate or are annihilated by a module element. Um, it's you, you take all the elements that are annihilated and then make an ideal from those, which by definition would then also contain a bunch more elements that are annihilated. But anyway. <laughs> So it could add a sub ideal would also be an annihilator ideal. Just so you know. <laughs> Just so you know, it's not a unique thing. You can take sub ideals and it would still apply. Kabloom! And what that means is that you can take this massive laser and find inside it a smaller laser and it would still destroy everything. That's how powerful this is. And we can even put the little laser in there. Because it is possible to copy things and shrink things down. <laughs> Uh, and, <clears throat> and and just just while I'm here, uh, I, I talked before about the ass primes. Um, these are prime ideals that are annihilators. Um, they are the associated prime ideal of the annihilator ideal. So 
and they are denoted by ASS. Oh, it's cute. It's cute, miss. So this is the problem, right? Is that when when Rangdoll explains statistical methods and things like that, there is a certain element of like procedure, a certain element of like, okay, this is why we're doing this. I'm an algebraist. I don't have that. <laughs> Yeah, there is that. I'm just, I'm just like, we defined this thing. Anyway. <laughs> Maybe someone will use it. Maybe someone won't. Who Easy. knows? Some people find this useful, I, I assume. That's why it's an area that's taught widely. Ring, ring theory, ideals, all that sort of stuff, that's big. Like I say, the numbers, they're a ring. That's important. And so are yeah, a lot of other well, things. I, I don't know. know I, I stayed in groups. <laughs> I mean, you're, you're not going to see it outside of maths but i know pretty much any math degree is going to have at least one entry level proofs course and you are going to talk about rings and groups somewhere yeah. in there groups are important so if you're talking about it in undergraduate proofs courses um it's important somewhere they, they don't usually require a lot of this is a, this is a specialized area in undergraduate math because most of undergraduate math is just Here's the math you need in order to do anything actually interesting. Nice. Right, let's draw another thing. Yes. So, moving out of statistics, I've actually got a fractal term <gasps> here. Uh, Fractals! Now... Excuse my pronunciation, because a lot of fractal stuff, for whatever reason, is like Germanic stuff if it's not explicitly English, and I, I can never tell how these are pronounced unless someone who actually knows says it. Um, the Hossdorf dimension. Hossdorf dimension. Um... So, uh, 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 mm. Right, okay. <laughs> that actually, uh, that does ring a bell. Um, I think I've heard that before, but I can't remember exactly what it is. Um, Hossdorf dimension. Oh, let's find out. Hossdorf dimension. Hossdorf dimension, apparently. Thank you, Hazel. <laughs> Hossdorf dimension. Hossdorf dimension, apparently. Thank you, Hazel. So, now we just uh, wonder if Hazel can pronounce <laughs> more Germanic. Yeah, Germanic. It's a it's yeah, that's Germanic. <laughs> Horsdorf. Oh, I'm glad it's I started drawing be before <laughs> I read that because this picture would be very different. Um <laughs> Halsdorf dimension. Uh, well, I mean, dwarf dimensions are probably sort of small on account of the fact that they're short. So I I went with dwarf, um, which I think I don't, I don't know what language it is means village. Um, I believe dorp is the equivalent in Dutch. Uh, uh, there's a game called Dorf Romantic, which is where I first heard it. Um, house dwarf is pretty funny in general because house is house and dwarf is village. That's what I'm drawing. I'm drawing the dimension in which a village lives in a house rather than the other way around. Um. <laughs> It's a, a weird dimension. Surrealist art, why not? Um, <laughs> Dorf is village in German. Ah, nice. So now... I'm going to do this like a sort of weird New Yorker cartoon. <laughs> I mean, it's not a New Yorker cartoon until you write Christ, what an asshole down there at the bottom. <laughs> I mean, just any... I wanted to say punchline, that's, that's inaccurate. Um... Hmm. 
You are businessman. Carrying suitcase. Vitally important for this picture. <laughs> Salesman, maybe? Picture Salesman. Also, the door does not fit the frame. Do not concern yourself. <clears throat> It's fine. I'm sure that's fine. Nothing to see here. Don't worry about it. Um, okay, explain the house dwarf dimension of a fractal. So, <clears throat> okay, whenever you are dealing with fractals, so part of the reasons why mathematicians sort of tripped up with fractals is fractals are finite in one sense, but infinite in another sense. So you will have some fractals like the Coke Snowflake, which um, for those of you who were not familiar with that, where did my pen go? I started I drawing it before oh the fractal gave me the prompt. <laughs> it's a fun fractal to doodle. Yeah, it's pretty easy. So basically it's just a triangle... A, a, a triangle uh, with triangles attached to it over and over again to make sort of a <clears throat> um, snowflake pattern, hence, hence the name. So you start with, this is going to be just sort of a sketch, do a triangle, take a third of each of the sides and add a triangle onto it. Another equilateral triangle, and then take each of these sides, add more equilateral triangles. And then take each of those sides and add more equilateral triangles and more and more and more. And you just keep on going. Um, and at every stage, you essentially divide any line into three and then put a little triangle that's a third of the length. Yeah. And so you end up with a shape that is finite in the sense of area. So as far as area is concerned, it takes up a limited amount of space. But technically... Uh, if you go out all the way, it has an infinite curvature around the outside. So it's an infinitely long curve that's confining a finite space. And that's weird. So you you have this thing where it's like, right, we have these things that are sort of in between dimensions. So how are we going to talk about what dimension this shape has? So in mathematics, uh, objects with dimension, a point is typically uh, determined to have zero dimension, no length, width, or breadth. A line has one dimension. Uh, something like a square has two dimensions. A cube has three <laughs> dimensions. Beyond that, it becomes harder to visualize because uh, we don't live in a visually four-dimensional space. More on that on Wednesday. Not in that sense. So the... Uh, the Hausdorff dimension is a way to sort of numerically summarize what dimension a fractal has um, by basically talking about, well, if you have something in, say, two dimensions and you scale it, how many copies do you need relative to the scaling? And you've got a similar thing here. When you have, whenever you're talking about a fractal, especially these constructed fractals, they're usually made using what's called a copies of copies method, where you take the overall shape shrink it and copy it in a whole bunch of places and then do that over and over again. And so we take that basic idea of dimension where, let's see, it's the, uh, God, what was it? Copies is dimension squared, I think. Hold on. I always get the formula flip-flopped unless I'm looking either looking directly at it or I construct it myself because that's what happens when you do enough math. You forget the summary equations and you just remember how to build it up. Yep. Always learn the proof, not the result. Which means that I have known at least one... Basically, it means I, I know at least a couple of people who are like, oh, well, I'm not going to remember all of these physics relationships because I can just build them up from calculus. <laughs> and that's what they do any time they're dealing with that. It's like, why, why remember the physics when I can just build it up from calculus? And it's like, I, I, never, that's... I, <laughs> I never learned the quotient rule in calculus because I knew the chain rule and the product rule. Mm -hmm. It was like, just combine them. <laughs> 
Yeah, well, I, I did that when I took differential equations because that meant that was one less equation that I had to keep in my head. Ah, oh, there we go. Exactly. So. Work smarter, not harder. So. so the number of copies you need is equal to the scale factor raised to the dimension that you're in. Um, and so basically the idea is if you have a fractal that's made using the copies of copies method, you can figure out, well, how many copies are made when I scale um, and what is the scale factor and then use uh, logarithms to solve for the dimensions and you end up with these partial dimensions. So like the Coke snowflake <clears throat> um, <clears throat> is a scale factor of three, I believe. And then with the copies, let's see how many copies have we technically made. I remember it better with the Sierpinski triangle because that one's a little more obvious and I do it more often. Because then I get to draw it and everyone's like, oh, it's a, Triforce. It's like, well, yes. So I think I just have ah four. Okay, <clears throat> and our number of copies is four. So our dimension ends up being uh log four over log three. Obviously. <laughs> well, I, you, you use exponents to solve for, you use logarithms to solve for the exponent there. Um, but log four over log three is uh, not a nice number. It's like 1.25 ish, 1.26, somewhere around there. So you've got this shape that can only exist on a two-dimensional plane at the very least. So it can't exist in one-dimensional space. But it's not fully a two-dimensional object because we've got this weird shenanigans going on with its uh, boundary. And it uh, turns out these are very useful shapes. Um, so I don't know if any of you guys remember uh, back when cell phones were like bricks that you had to like pull the antenna out of in order to make a phone call, like like with the old ham radios had to pull the antenna out. Uh, there's a reason why you don't have to do that anymore. Uh, it's because your phone antenna is internal and it's a fractal. And because of the fractal shape, not only can we make it smaller, it's also able to pick up more types of signals with a single antenna versus having a bunch of different antenna for different signals. So you don't need a separate you don't need a separate thing for your Wi-Fi, your telephone, your Bluetooth, etc. It can all just be on the same thing. And be very small because it's a fractal. <clears throat> Herbert's association is going to get up about this yard. Or is it the Village Owners Association? Oh, sweet dwarf. <laughs> I just saw the sign because I've been doodling <laughs> Coke Snowflakes. <laughs> doodle fractals. Everybody doodle fractals. They're fun. Yee. Or mess around with online fractal generators, because those are also fun. Those are also fun. Fractals are good. I like... Um, well, that's not really a fractal. It's not a good example. Um, <laughs> various generative formulae for making things. Um, well, I mean, not all fractals are pictures. There's at least a couple of fractals that I know are mostly just equation in nature. There's at least one of the monsters that's just de defined by a uh, iterative function. 
Like I think one of the more, I think the Mendelbrot set is technically just defined using an iterative function. It's an iterative function on complex numbers. And then the Mandelbrot is just made by plotting the points of the numbers. Like this is your in, this is your out, plot the point, take your out, make it the new in, plot, find a new out, plot that point. I've never actually bothered to look up what the Mandelbrot set is. I keep seeing it everywhere. People love that thing. Never bothered to work out what it is. Someone's graffitied the house with maths. <laughs> so what happens in uh, Dorf House, which is the village that this house is in? I thought that was the village that is inside the house. No, no, that's House Dorf. And one of those houses in there contains Dorf, Dorf House. It's a fractal. It keeps going. Oh god, we're doing the um... <clears throat> What's the name of that puzzle game that came out recently that has the dimensions and dimensions? Oh, Patrick's Parabox. Yeah, the Parabox one. That one's a trip, and I love it. Uh, I want to play also it. Loved when, I, I loved when I watched Barry play some of it because he just kind of kept making, oh, oh. <laughs> L- lots of, oh no, my brain is hurting noise. Yeah, that, that and 5D chess. I want to I wanna have a go at those at some point. Anyway, this is House Dorf. Dorf House. Um, <laughs> yeah, if I was like a New Yorker cartoonist, I would probably make that look nicer in the same amount of time. Everybody look up someone like Graham Annabelle. He knows what he's doing. Also play the puzzle agent games. He made those. Um, speaking of puzzles... This reminds me of a puzzle. Where have we gone? Boom. Ragdoll. Yes. Uh, <laughs> I did actually have one here. Given that you know a decent amount about fractals, you probably already know about the, the flow snake. I mean, I could still draw a flow snake. <laughs> I mean, not but the I... flow snake, but draw, draw a picture based off of the name flow snake. <laughs> No, I've got other ones that might be more fun. Um, a snark. Do you want to draw a snark? Oh, God. That... <laughs> so I, I don't know if this is a thing over in the UK as well, but over in the Americas, we have this thing called a snipe. No. And uh, the thing is, they don't exist. Oh, <laughs> so you don't have them. <laughs> but... You have this thing on like campouts and whatnot where it's like, oh, we're going to go snipe hunting. Uh, and basically it's a way to sort of like troll the newbies. <clears throat> so it's like, we're going to go snipe hunting, except now we're going to go snark hunting. Snark. M- Miss suggests a snail shark. Um, I have just discovered that there is a particular snark called the flower snark. D- so feel free to do that. <laughs> Well, now I'm just going to draw Lewis wearing a lot of flowers. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? So Snark actually comes from group, th- not group theory, graph theory, which I also like. Because it's kind of basically set theory. Um, <laughs> it's just two sets. Um, the draw if you draw the snipe. Mm, I don't know. I mean, they might have. They've drawn a lot of things between regular episodes and various live streams, some of which are still available, some of which are not. Uh, So there's a rough description of a... Drawing a shark, drawing a snark. You can hear Jacob and Nathan talking about snipes. Share the episode if you can find it. Um, so yeah, snark comes from uh, graph theory. Graphs in this instance not being like bar charts and lines and all that sort of stuff. A graph is a series of points connected by lines. So you could just point, put dots everywhere and then 
draw lines connecting any two of them together, that's a graph. Um, and a lot of interesting things come from graphs because they're very vaguely defined, no, abstractly defined. <laughs> Got in trouble for calling, <laughs> calling abstract things vague before. Um, but uh, one of the interesting things that it's used for is a theorem that people like um, called the four color theorem, which is if you have a map, any map, whatever the map of, you know, countries, munis municipal boroughs, whatever, um, just a map of regions, uh, you need at most four colors to color in the entire thing such that any two adjacent areas on the map have a different color. Um, some of you can get away with three, some of you can get away with two, but four is the max. Um, you will never need to use five. Um, Unless and... you're just really bad at placing the colors. Yes, <laughs> you, you, might, you might paint yourself into a corner, but <laughs> there will always be some way of doing it with four. Um, and if you want to prove that there will always be some way of doing it with five or fewer, um, that's real easy. You can do that, no problem, um, using graphs. It's, it's, it's great and lovely and fantastic. If you want to prove that you can do it with four, have they managed to make it easier to prove that yet? <laughs> the, only, <laughs> the only proof, like full, full on proof that I know essentially res uh, boils down to, well, all of the cases can boil down to these cases, and then we made the machine handle them. Yeah. Uh, which there is... <laughs> through a, a lot of mathematicians did not like that. No. It was the first proof by computer, essentially. <laughs> um, and, I mean, but, yeah, essentially but... what it is, is it's proof by exhaustion. Yeah, um, yeah. We're just there, having there... the computer do the work. There, there's no... It, it, it's, it's disappointing for two reasons. One, no human's actually seen the entire proof. Um, and two... It doesn't tell you anything. Like, it proves the result, yeah, but it doesn't tell you why. It just says that it can't not be. <laughs> you know? Like, the, the, there has been, I've seen a justification of it that is smaller, where basically the idea is that, um, oh, what are they called? Um, plane graphs. Uh, basically, the whole idea is that the most complicated plane graph you can get. Uh, when you're dealing with something like a map is k4 um k4 being we have four dots and all of them have a line connecting them um and basically that's sort of the justification for why it doesn't really need to be much more complicated than that because k5 you're not going to be able to have a map that has k5 on it it's the most complicated yeah. complete graph as a subgraph of the graph is going to be k4 but that's not a that's not a proof. That's just no. <laughs> uh, that's just a a thought process of why it makes sense. But it's not enough. Um, yeah. So a snark is a graph um, where all of the nodes, all of the corners. In fact, I think did you just draw a snark? I think you just draw a snark. Um, <laughs> where all of the uh, nodes or points have three vertices coming out of them um oh i guess no this isn't a snark for obvious for what i'm about to say um in such a way that you can't color the edges with only three colors um again the fact that that's planar is probably a good explanation <laughs> via the four color theorem as to the fact that that isn't a snark um so yeah and it turns out that you could state the four-color theorem as, as saying that every snark is non-planar. If you can prove that, you can prove the four-color theorem. Turns out that's just as complicated. Um, but it's equivalent, so that's nice. Um, I, can draw, I can draw a snark for you. And, and then we just make a bunch of snarks, put them into a computer, and then piss off all the mathematicians. <laughs> But I don't need to do this. I'm going to just do them as big dots. Turn off my stabilizer to make this work. Yeah, like... So, for those of you who do not know, uh, proof by exhaustion is basically a proof where you go through every single possible outcome and prove that it is or is not 
the case. Uh, the problem with proof by exhaustion in most cases is that there's too many things to go through, too many possible ways to go through them. Um, so in practice, it's not really used because it's not feasible. Like the most you will do is you will use it for things like really special cases. So I, I remember I remember in my proofs courses, there was a lot of things when we were doing number theory things where if we were dealing with integers, we would handle one and two separately. And then lump everything else sort of together because one and two uh, are notoriously weird. But yeah, most yeah. of the time, proof by exhaustion <laughs> is just not feasible because there's just too many options. But if you have a computer that can do it for you and you can prove that, yes, these are all of the exhaustive ways of doing this, which as far as I'm aware, they were able to prove that everything simplified down to one of their limited but still way too many graph types. So that part was at least... Map, <laughs> but but yeah, it's one of those things of like yeah, but no one's seen it. We have the computer do it. Hey, miss, miss, you think you think that's the summoning circle? How about how about this one? <laughs> this is the Descartes snark, which I'm not drawing. I mean, you could take your snark and just copy it a bunch of times to make that. What? <laughs> it's all summoning circles. <laughs> just that enemy with the girl and the pet dog and the brothers. Yeah. That's Full Metal full, Alchemist. Full Metal Alchemist. Apothecarist. Summoning all the way down. Turns out graph theory. It's all about summoning things. I like graph theory. And graph sometimes theory, so. the thing you are summoning is your graduate advisor who's very annoyed at you. <laughs> um, one of the other things I was considering putting on here, but it's not quite silly enough, um, was the handshake lemma, which is also from graph theory. Um, it just kind of sounds silly. Um, but which basically says that if you draw a graph... Uh, and you you count each of the uh, for, for each of the points how many edges are coming out of that point, and you add them all up. The answer will be even, which is nice. Um, but uh, the reason is very straightforward: is that every edge has two ends, so the total is going to be <laughs> the number of edges times two. Um, but what that does mean. Uh, is that? Oh, look at the flower crown. Oh. Um, <laughs> a little flower crown for the snoke. <laughs> Thank you, miss. Uh, but what that does mean is that because the total number of it's going to be even, the number of uh, corners or the number of points that are going to have an odd number of things coming out of them have to be there has to be an even number of those because an odd plus an odd is an even. Um, so you need all of the odd numbered ones to be paired up so that when you add it all together, you get an even number. And this is important for if you want to draw one of these things uh, without taking your pen off the paper. Um, which is called Eulerian, I believe. I always get Eulerian and Euclidean mixed up. I think it's Eulerian. Um, or Eulerian, probably, more accurately. Well, um, the, the Euclidean I know with graph theory has to do with traversing edges, so you're probably right with it being... Oh, Euler it's probably Euclidean. Okay. Um, it's one of the two. It's always I always get them mixed up. It's probably Euclidean. Um, but the idea being, so for example, you probably hands up those of you who've who've done. Whoops, I need to lay it. Um, hands up those of you who've drawn this before. Okay, no, I'm backwards. Euler Euler path is the traver traverse every edge once. <laughs> it is yeah okay so it is Eulerian, um so yeah if if a graph is Eulerian, 
it means you can do that. You can draw something without taking your pen off the paper. You can traverse every single path without having to go through another path you've already been through. Um, and it turns out, in order to do that, every corner needs to have either an even number of lines coming out of it, or at most, two of them have an odd number of lines coming out of them. And the reason for that is that if you're just doing this as one long continuous path, all of the corners you meet in the middle of the path, you're going to go in them and then out of them. And then maybe later on you'll come back in and then come back out. So that'll be an even number of uh, lines coming out of it. But the one you start at and the one you end at, they could be odd because you just leave them and that's one. <laughs> and maybe you come back later and leave again and then you've added two more, that's three. So it keeps being odd. Uh, but maybe you end at the same point and then it becomes even again. So all of the ones in the middle are going to be even, and maybe the ones at the end can be odd. But what that means is that this... Um, I don't know, that's fine. How, how, can, we, how can we ruin this? Because the reason this works is because that's got two coming out of it, and they've got four, but they've got three. Oh no, bad times. So if we do that, now all of these corner ones have three, and now there's no way of doing it. Because... <laughs> I thought you were unfolding it. <laughs> That's another uh, one that... Is, that should be doable, right? No? Yeah. There's a three and a five. Yeah, so this one is. But again, it's that you have to start and end at a different spot. Yeah. Um, if they're all even, you can start and finish at the same spot. Um, in fact, you have to. Um, but yeah, so there, there's a little a little result um, to do with graphs and drawing stuff without taking your pen off paper. Always cheat if you can, always. <laughs> and you can cheat by taking your pen off the paper because nobody's forcing you to. <laughs> Yeah, the, the way we uh, cheat that in mathematics is we uh, just add an extra edge. Yeah. It's fine, don't worry about it. No one will know. Like, like legitimately, that's how we force something to be something that's Eulerian. and we, we just add another edge somewhere. Oh, sorry, I should, I should specify slightly more specifically. Um, Eulerian is when they're all even. Uh, Semi-Eulerian is if there are two that are odd that you start and finish at. Um... So the little house, that would be semi-Eulerian because there's a definite start and finish point. Um, but you could just add another edge and make it fully Eulerian. You could put a roof on the bottom of the house as well. <laughs> Turns out a double-sided house, fully Eulerian. Or Eulerian. I keep saying Eulerian, but it's... Um, yeah, I've just it's, noticed... I think it's Euler. Yeah, it's, it's based... Euler probably was the person who did this and I didn't know it, his name prior to learning about these things, so in my head it's just Eulerian. Also, by the way, this is the flower snuck. It's not as it's not as good as what Ragdoll drew. Looks nice though. It's another summon summoning circle. I mean I can see why they called it a flower. Yeah, it's quite nice. Assuming they're naming it after, you know, sort of what it looks like and not just flower shorthand for something else related to it. I'm, I'm assuming it's because it looks like a flower. Um, <laughs> it was named after Johnny Flower. No. Um, I mean, you never know with these things. <laughs> well, uh, one, of the, one of my suggestions on my list was Killing Field, which is named after Wilhelm Killing. <laughs> Um, which at the beginning of this you mentioned the Wilhelm scream and that, that just was the first thing that came into my mind um, yeah and another one was Syzygy I wanted to know what you drew for Syzygy well, that is a fun word at least it's a fun word three Y's Syzygy Ragdolls is good I like, I like Ragdolls um, oh, and a wild knot. The shark. Good shark. Uh, well, that's 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 all we've got time for. Um, <laughs> let's stick everything on. Why not? 
Blip, blip, blip. Oh, Jib, Jib, Jib. Yeah. We drew, we drew tired cats for you. I don't know if Jib's still here, but Jib, <laughs> but we drew tired cats for you. We did the thing. Ha <laughs> ha. Sleepy cats. Sleepy. Is you? Yeah. And also Christy, if they're watching. Um, yeah. Anyway. Yeah. And now everything else. <laughs> Even though Including some minor. <laughs> Got some formula going on. Oh god, there's a lot going on on the left. <laughs> yeah, that's because that's where I sort of put all of my visual representation of what I was talking about. Oh, your 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 little K four is matching up rather nicely with the graph, the scatter graph, and the bell curve. <laughs> they all fit. They all fit together on top of the cock snowflake. It's a good time. Yeah, catty cat me emotes. We have cats. I should make a little bongo tap of probably Flynn. <laughs> Um, but yeah, thank you for coming along. Thank you for indulging our mathematical nonsense. You'll be pleased to know more of this will happen on Wednesday. Um, because I intend to try and explain my thesis, <laughs> which is publicly available on the, the Kent Academic Repository. Um, if anyone wants to read beforehand, I know you're very excited. Um, but before then, more importantly, we have him. You understood none of it, but it's interesting. Oh, we'll try. Um, we try. Best we can do. So yeah, we got we got Heman on Tuesday. Tuesday Heman. Uh, Tuesday is a very special day for reasons I can't explain, but it is. Um, and I will be either very excited or very tired. <laughs> Come that stream. So I've been quiet. No worries. You're doing mass puzzles the whole time. That we we would want nothing less um but yes we have some him and uh we're gonna try and explore more of columbia because i just got very lost <laughs> during the last attempt um i've played that game too much now i've played i've exhausted the previous two missions um but yeah. welcome to the chat room <laughs> hi bear uh yeah so we've got him and uh, on Wednesday, I will be uh, doodling along to an explanation of my thesis, or the abstract at least, um, probably at most. Maybe, yeah, that's an upper bound. Um, this was chill, thanks. Yeah, I'm glad. Uh, Saturday, we're back for more. Uh, is it War Totals on Saturday, or are other things happening? Some things are happening with me, but I think we should be fine for a stream. Um, uh, and then Sunday, something that isn't maths, probably. I mean, um, unless everyone else is going to be gone and leave the mathematicians to just do whatever, in which case. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we have a regular maths Sundays. <laughs> Some days. That's the best I've got. Um, oops, all math. Oop, we will oops. sit here and I'll try and explain to Chris how statistics comes out of probability theory. Yay. <laughs> if you could just give me a solid foundation on probability theory, like axiomatic, I'll be happy. Prove. Prove things, please. <laughs> um, also, I've just looked at what CC's saying of what we're talking about. I can imagine this entire stream was gibberish. Um, cause I wasn't yeah, talking about... considering how many times I had to change uh, automatic captioning on videos that I've made, it's probably just a wash. I mean, CC understands you way more than me. So... <laughs> CC always says gibberish. Yeah, but in particular with maths. You know? It's gonna be... Maths is already kind of gibberish. There, there were a lot of hippopotamuses with the lectures for the geometry class I was teaching. So, <laughs> uh, you will note there are no hippopotamuses in my geometry class. It's just that mm -hmm. anything that started with an H suddenly became a hippopotamus. 
That sounds like a flaw with your geometry class, really. Um, there should be more hippopotamuses. Um, oh yeah, all of my vowels are uh. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's my accent, I can't help it. Everything gets transformed to uh. Uh, like that. Anyway, I'm going to shut up now. Uh, thanks for joining Blackbird and chatting maths, and I hope everybody found it relaxing. Um, bye! Bye-bye.